if you have an emotional response to something, mm -hmm. you're more likely to form a memory. And so what I do with my demonstrations is tap into that visual piece, show the students who are having a hard time learning other ways, show them how cool it is, and they can actually visualize the science. Kate Bieberdorf is a professor of science for the University of Texas. These days, she's better known as Kate the Chemist. Her explosive and entertaining experiments have taken her from the college campus to network television. She shares a passion with Notre Dame's College of Science for teaching audiences of all ages to fall in love with scientific discovery. That's what made her an ideal choice to deliver the College of Science Christmas lecture. I talked with Kate ahead of her lecture for this episode of Notre Dame Stories. Welcome to Notre Dame Stories, the official podcast of the University of Notre Dame. Here we take you along the journey where curiosity becomes a breakthrough for people using knowledge to be a means for good in the world. Kate, it's so great to have you here at Notre Dame. You grew up not far from here, is yes. that right? So welcome to South Bend, but you've Thank probably you. been in the area. Tell us about where a you grew up. A couple times. I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan, so it's about an hour drive away from here-ish. Um, and I came to Notre Dame a lot. I was here in 2018 for BCCE. It's a chemistry conference that I went to, and my uncle worked for Notre Dame, so I was on campus really? a lot growing up. Yeah, he was a, a chef. He was a head chef here, so got some good food. Awesome. It was really fun. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. Thinking back to those days growing up in Kalamazoo, Mizzou, when did your love for science start? Is it that far back? Well, okay, so I get this question a lot, mm -hmm. but I've always been inquisitive in nature, so I wanted to know why, how, like how does this work? I drove my parents crazy with those questions, but it wasn't until my sophomore year of high school when I met Mrs. Kelly Palsrock, love you, I love you, <laughs> um, and she was the best teacher ever, and she would run around the classroom, light stuff on fire, and honestly, ever since I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a chemist mm -hmm. because of this passionate, wonderful, wonderful woman. We are the Bill Nye the Science Guy generation. Yes. Right? Yes. There was no female equivalent. None. Until you. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess. But there were there everyone's out there. That's the thing. Like they're out there. The sure. the female scientists are out there, but for whatever reason I was able to break through the mold just a tiny bit and get on TV and show that you can be a girl and like Louboutins and breathe fire and love science. Like it's okay to like all those different things. Did you feel like there was a gap there as a young person? There's this person I want to emulate and she doesn't exist or at least not in a sphere where I can watch her. I I don't think I realized that. Like, I don't think I put it to words when I was younger that there wasn't somebody out there because you're just so used. I mean, this is what you know. Bill Nye is out there. Um, Mr. Wizard was before him. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't really until I started being a professor at the University of Texas, Hocum Horns, um, mm -hmm. and I was bored. I was just teaching and I had this extra time and I started doing demonstrations. I started going out to schools and then they invited me on TV. And once I started looking around for it, it really hit me. I was like, there isn't anyone here. There's not a single person that looks like me, acts like me, and loves science like me. And so when the people called and said, do you want to do national TV? I'm like, hell yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I have to tell you, I was watching you on the Today Show with mm -hmm. my girls. They're nine and six. Oh, great. And especially my nine-year-old. She couldn't get close enough to the screen. Mm -hmm. She just mm -hmm. was so enthralled. What is it about that age, that not quite preteen, right. that's such an important time for girls? So is that fourth grade, fifth grade? Yeah, third grade. Yeah. Third grade. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. So yeah, it's right there. That's the sweet spot. Like the third through fifth grade, right before puberty, before middle school mm -hmm. usually, where they're still passionate, their brain is starting to function, they're starting to understand that, hey, there's science behind magic, mm -hmm. and they can really start to understand what you're saying. And that's honestly when I think we need to jump in so fast. So like, thank you for showing the videos. I really appreciate that. Like, way to They'll go, mom. That was amazing. Okay, good, good, good. Um, because what, what I'm trying to do is essentially interact with as many young girls and students in general, mm -hmm. but young girls, and try to get them so passionate about the sciences that when they inevitably get a question wrong in class, you know, they we've all done it, right? Sure. When they inevitably get the question wrong, they have enough confidence to just brush it off and move on and not think like, oh, I'm not a math person or I'm not mm -hmm. a science person. It's like, no, you can do all of this, absolutely all of this, but we all make mistakes. Like, it's just, it's just part of learning. It is. Yeah. Talk about the students then you teach at the university and the students that'll be here night, tonight at the college age. Yeah. 
And what is it about that phase of life that energizes you about your work? Or did you learn from them to figure out what you should, what you wanted your um, mm -hmm. roadshow to be? I, th I think a little bit of both, right? Um, so my students are 18 years old. They're the babies. They're freshmen. They're learning laundry and stoichiometry yeah. at the same time. Like, so it's just such a wonderful phase of life to watch them because when they first walk into my classroom, they are still high school seniors. Like mm -hmm. I can see it on their face. And by the time they leave now, which yesterday was my last class at UT um, for the semester, and it was the last day of class, and they're walking out and they're adults. They are mature, like the, what they have gone through in those three months, they just grow up so much. And it's so cool to watch them succeed and realize their dreams are possible. They, they might actually be a doctor, like th they are getting close to that goal. And so it's really fun to be part of that. And I love doing that. But when I do these big shows like this, it's where I can play with the fire and the liquid nitrogen and I can kind of step back from the classroom because in the classroom it's 75 minutes, mm -hmm. I have to teach these topics, we're getting through a curriculum, like it's really rushed. Whereas this, it's like, do you want to come here and give a Christmas lecture and just have fun with science? I'm like, yes, 100% sign me up. I've got nine amazing demos that I've got planned for tonight. I'm just, I'm so excited to do it. And talk about how you really engage all the senses in um, creating this love for science. I mean, visually, of course, it's mm -hmm. stunning what you do, but there's smells, there's um, feels, yes. of course. And that's an important component to making sure young people fall in love with um, their future career. Right, absolutely. So I am a big person who believes in VARC. It's these different learning styles. And it just it just kind of says that people kind of pick up information differently. So you might be more of a visual learner or maybe oral or maybe reading. And so I love the fact that these, these demonstrations can actually show chemistry a little bit because I can't hand you an atom or a molecule. That's really hard to visualize. But if I take a paint can and shake it up and the lid hits the ceiling. <laughs> My students are like, what's up with that? Yeah. How did that happen? And so the theory behind it, it's William James's theory of emotional memory. And basically what that says is if you have an emotional response to something, mm -hmm. you're more likely to form a memory. And so what I do with my demonstrations is tap into that visual piece, show the students who are having a hard time learning other ways, show them how cool it is, and they can actually visualize the science. And then the research shows you literally have 60 seconds after you do the experiment to get them to learn. Wow. So, yeah, it's really fast. And so like I breathe fire and then I'm like, heat, work, thermodynamic, just as fast as I can, just shove the knowledge into their brain. Um, because after that, it kind of slows down and you lose their attention again. So. But you're right, you're creating a memory. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. It's very powerful. And it's just like you said, like the smell could be it. it. They could remember the sulfur smell or maybe like that burnt sugar smell. And that's enough for them that when they smell it again somewhere, it's going to trigger the memory. They're going to know what's up. They can explain it to their friends. Probably not, but hopefully like a girl can dream. <laughs> now your audience tonight and one of the really exciting things that Notre Dame is doing is providing an event like this, not mm -hmm. only for our campus community, but the wider community. Mm -hmm. So truly people from ages five to 105 yep. will be here at the Christmas lecture. Why is that so important to engage, not just not just students, but students at every level and our community? Well, I think it's possible that even at 100 or 105, maybe you don't know how much you love science yet. So it's always a challenge for me. If I can get people to like chemistry just a little bit more than when I walked in the door, it's a success. And so if I have somebody here who's five years old just picking up the word beaker, or maybe they hear the word molecule for the first time, they have no idea what it means, but they've heard it, right? Whereas the 100-year-old, or maybe maybe the 80 year old let's drop it down just a little bit <laughs> where the 80 year old might still be interested in like hey i've always wondered that for 80 years i've wondered why this is or how that works and it's a way to just kind of sneak that in and even at 80 you can decide that you want to be a scientist and so i am here for everybody anybody who wants to show up and watch me do science like you are my you are my person like let's go <laughs> we're so glad you're here thank, thank you. you for talking to me of course thank you so much this is such a pleasure and honor truly appreciate it <laughs> you ready one After our chat, Cade wowed a packed audience in the Jordan Hall of Science. There was even overflow in the lecture hall next door. She used a sensory experience to enhance learning. She breathes fire, we learn about thermodynamics. She blows the lid off a paint can, we learn about chemical reactions. 
to end the night an Instagram-worthy moment when Kate was inducted as an honorary member of the College of Science. Thanks for joining us for Notre Dame Stories, the official podcast of the University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame Stories is created by the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. It's written and produced by Andy Fuller with content coordination from Stacey Stikovich. This episode was edited by Michael Weens with videography by Tony Fuller and Zach Dudka. Original music is by Alex Mansour. And I'm your host, Jenna Liberto.